Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the start of season two of Spanning the Need with Anthony Spano. Today's episode, we're going to talk to a guy who's changing the world in one step at a time. We'll talk to Dr. Huha Pekka, the co founder and chief technology officer of Solar Wind Solar Foods in Finland. We'll discuss life, how the evolution of food production with a method that is you may not know, and how they'll impact in the future. Doctor, thank you for joining me. I know I know it's seven o'clock there at your time, and I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Mm, thanks for having me. So we talk about food production, we talk about just the way the atmosphere and I should say the world is changing. And you've seen that probably in the last two years with all these storms and everything. So how did you before we start to get into that, how did you start where you are now? How did you start your career? Yes, so I have, uh, yeah, so I studied chemical engineering and basically from the beginning of my studies, I wanted to do something from sustainable resources. So I majored in bioprocess engineering, so basically using cells, microorganisms or single cell organisms to produce something in a bioreactor. So kind of a subcategory of chemical engineering if you like. So um, I've worked at PTT, Technical Research Center of Finland. So there I was working with uh, lignocellulosic raw materials. So in Finland, we have a lot of forests, a lot of wood biomass. So basically utilizing this woody biomass, well, to begin with, uh, to make fuels and chemicals. So bioethanol research with yeast is the one topic that I have studied a lot. But that is, of course, I mean, making fuels and chemicals, so that's very much dependent on the fossil fuel prices. So around year 2014, the kind of fossil fuel was high and uh, bioethanol seemed to be going down. The oil prices came down and then a lot of bioprocess engineering companies had to think that, okay, what do we need to do next? And also at that time, we started thinking at VTT, so how should we actually do this? So then we started looking into CO2 and electricity, so especially renewable electricity as the raw materials. So roughly five years ago, we shifted more from using biomass to using CO2 and electricity or kind of energy from the sun more directly. And I and I think that that brings a good point is because we're so we're so fascinated and we we use so much fossil fuels of our world and mm. we have to kind of think outside the box. So you're kind of bringing a whole new perspective of what we can do with the stuff that we would never think of. Mm. Yeah, I mean we could do so many things from CO two and renewable electricity, so solar power essentially or wind power, hydropower wave power. So all of these forms, in a way, they originate from sun. So rather, whether it's the solar power directly or wind power, hydropower, so these are kind of because of the solar activity, because the energy the sun radiates on the globe. So essentially how we can utilize this energy more directly instead of digging up the fossil resources. So this is clearly something that we need to develop. And CO2 is a plentiful resource so in it's i mean it's very technically it's very possible to make fuels from co2 and renewable electricity but there the competition with fossil energies is, is much more present so it's basically not possible to compete with price well and and we will talk about a little bit about that how in the next couple of years you'll be building a um, commercial plant to actually start the process of creating the food production that we may not, that we'll may have in the future. And mm. so we talk about that you're, you're looking at using CO2 and using to a variety of different water, renewable energy. So how did the sol- solar foods come up play? Yeah. So at our time in VTT, so both me and our CEO, Pasi Vainikka, so we have a VTT background, so research background, Pasi is more from energy side. So we were thinking that, okay, 
we cannot really compete with fossil energy prices in the energy market, but what could we do other things from CO2 and renewable electricity? So then we thought that, okay, with microbes, we can grow essentially food from CO2 and electricity. So that is when we decided soon, three years ago, we decided that, okay, we, we can establish a company and build on what we have learned on our research, research careers. So we can kind of focus on using microorganisms, CO2, renewable electricity to make food. And this is, of course, another thing what humankind needs. So what are the basic needs in our human life? We need food and we need energy. We need shelter. And so how does that process work? So let's talk about how food production will be viable with you guys in the future. So you talk about you want, you're going to use CO2. Mm-hmm. You're going to use renewable energy. And you said you're going to use water to help process. How does that all work when we talk about that you can just process this without growing it or without doing using fossil fuels that we have to to make our world a better place? Yeah, so in the heart of the process is the microorganism, which we have discovered from nature. So this is a microorganism that is, for instance, part of the soil microbe so different soil microbes so this is one of them so in essence this is pretty much the same as making beer or growing yeast for kind of growing baker's yeast for making bread or make producing lactic acid bacteria for yogurt so in essence what we have we have a bioreactor so this is of course a stainless steel tank so i mean if you go to breweries or microbreweries, so they have these stainless steel tanks. But oh, main- and I think everyone will like the breweries. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but the main difference is that we don't have yeast. We have a different microorganism. So yeast, of course, needs sugars, but we don't give sugars to this our production organism. So it uses CO2, and then with electricity and water, we make hydrogen. So in essence, energy from the power line electricity is converted to hydrogen. So then that's more kind of a chemical form of energy. And then hydrogen, these cells can utilize. So then they convert the hydrogen inside the cells to other energy carriers. And so what kind of food are we looking at? Like any specific types of food, like pasta or uh, strawberries. What what are we looking at when we look at food production? What kind of food are we talking about? Yeah, so what this biological process does, the outcome is a kind of protein-rich powder. So it has high protein content, roughly 65% of the, of the material is protein. So it has all the amino acids, all the essential amino acids that are needed are in this powder. And then it contains roughly 10% carbohydrates and less than 5% fatty acids and then some minerals. So in a way, it's high in protein. And of course, if you think like plants when they grow, so of course they have to grow the stems and leaves so that they can reach for the so that they can compete for the solar rays. But uh, in a bioreactor, when they are just kind of floating there, so then they don't have to have the kind of support structure. So then they can just focus on multiplying. So then it's kind of, the outcome is that it's high in protein. And so so, would we be putting this protein in like water or just eating the protein out of like a little bag or anything like that? So so people kind of understand what this protein, if you mix it, or is it just something that you would eat right out of a, a box or a little uh, a little container? Yeah, well, even though this could be considered as a space age thing, it's not really that we would be eating small protein pills. It's just a kind of flour-like ingredient like any other. Okay. On a, any other flour-like ingredient. So it can be thought of as a kind of a, 
corn flour or it's actually quite similar to i mean if we take soy and isolate protein so pro soy protein isolate or pea protein isolate so it has quite a lot of similarities to these kinds of materials these are already kind of already processed from growing pea or growing uh, soy so basically the protein is extracted from the beans and then you get this kind of protein rich flour so when we grow the organism in our bioreactor and dry it so we also get this protein rich flour and i think that that gives an understanding of people that are watching what this may look like down the road yeah so maybe the main idea currently is that this would be an ingredient for food manufacturers so it can be the ingredient for making the foods it also could be kind of just a flower like ingredient for for consumers also but this is of course we are consider further so that which would be easier and how far are you guys from um the full production i know um you guys just got uh, a great investment through through a comp through a um an investor that is ready to help you build your first commercial factory. So what's your timeline to roll it out to the public? Yeah, so currently we are we are operating in a pilot. So we have a pilot facility here in uh, Helsinki, Finland. And um, this, of course, produces only like 300 grams per day of material. So we need to go to a bigger scale. So we have indeed now secured uh, financing for building the next scale. So that would be a demonstrator facility. So the output of that should be closer to 300 kilos per day of material. So then that is roughly two and a half years until that should be ready. And also it, needs to be noted that as this is a mm, kind of a recently discovered organism, so this has not been used as a food before. So we are doing currently a lot of work to show that it is safe for human consumption. And of course, in Europe, as in US, so there are legislation in place for this kind of novel foods. So this is rather clear instructions and tests that we have to do in order to show that it's safe for human consumption so, so this, in, in in europe this will also take roughly two years until we are we are we get green light from the european union and, and and like you said we're probably looking at three to four years full distribution probably to the world if everything goes right the facility uh produces what you need to do does that sound about right give or yeah, take. It's about, yeah roughly so of course after that so this is i mean the next stage is just a demonstrator so we still need to go to full capa full capacity full scale production so this is still another three years down the road after the demo is ready but from the demonstrator we will that will produce material so that we can go to market and have the first products from that material. Well, and we talk about that food sources, depending where you are in the world, are shortage. There's a very, <laughs> so do you, and, and, and I'll ask this question, you're the scientist, you're, you're the biologist, is climate change real? <laughs> it, 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 you, I'm just, hey, your opinion, I should say, because I think people need to understand that people think, oh, no, it's just storms. But if you really look at the data, OK, the storms have increased over the last decade, let yeah. alone the temperature of the world. Yeah, of course, climate change is real. And basically, the further you go, the more clearer it is. So we are basically, I guess we are somewhere in the as north as Anchorage in Finland. So basically last winter, it was the first winter that 
we didn't have much snow at all here in Helsinki area. So I, we have a house and we have lived there 12 years and this was the first winter I didn't have to take the snow away from the from the driveway. And in, in what's your average so, snowfall in in Finland? Uh, so roughly, I mean here in Helsinki areas, maybe 30 centimeters. Further in Lapland, it's one meter. Because I know we talk about it like I remember last year, at least in, I'm, I'm in the United States and I'm in the Midwest, Ohio. It's in pretty much. Um, so we're just a little bit south of how we look on the equator. Hmm. And I know we didn't have the snowfall that we normally have. Yeah. And the temperatures this summer were were hotter than on record. Hmm. So and you really think about that if you have these very big different storms and climate change. Look what's happening in, in the United States and California, Oregon on the West Coast. All those fires. Yeah. I mean, it, some are man-made because of, of people that don't know how to either light a fire or they just do something that shouldn't they shouldn't do. Mm-hmm. Um, then you got normal lightning strikes. But that seems to be the normal of just the process of wilderness. Like yeah. a lightning strike, you fire, you let it burn. But it seems this is a little bit more worse than normal. Mm. Yeah, so I have been thinking this so that I think in life, like, I mean, we of course have life content in the bioreactor in our process. So life t- tends to kind of, it kind of ha- has this wave form. But then when it starts to go more and more off the kind of balance of the, of the equilibrium, So then I think that's what we are seeing also here with the climate, so in bigger scale in life. And, and, and I think that, that brings up a good point is you're actually working with some of the biggest agencies in the world. You just, I think about a year ago, you guys were selected to partner up and do some experiment stuff for the European Union. And the, uh, the, the uh, European Space Agency um, business incubator program to help sustain producing food in space. Talk a little bit about that and how that felt to get that. Yeah, so of course, if we think kind of what we are doing now, so this originates from from the 60s. So this, what we are doing, is not a new idea. And actually, NASA scientists in U.S. have published it in 1964, the first time. So basically, the original idea has been that uh, this would be a way to feed people on a long space missions and then also so yes we're then also investigating into that in the 60s and 70s but basically the original concept is from space research and then yeah so then we were we have been partner in the European Space Agency business incubation program and there indeed we did some calculations that if we would go with this process into space, how much, how big a reactor, like 40-liter reactor, could be enough to feed six people on uh, space missions. So basically the protein could be produced this way. We would still need to have some carbohydrates because this has, in a way, too much protein to fulfill the daily, to be just the only diet, so some carbohydrates are needed. But basically, I mean, when th- doing calculations related to the space missions, so they're kind of circulating everything and being as frugal as possible with everything. So that's the kind of the main exercise. But I guess in a way, it's also a good exercise for, I mean, for us staying here on planet Earth. So we also need to be more frugal on our own this kind of spaceship called planet Earth. Have you guys, have you guys been approached by anyone in the North American area or NASA to, to really work with you guys and, and do what you're doing in the European Union that they're very interested in what, what you have to offer? Because I know a lot of areas in the United, North America, I should say, I'm not just going to say the United States is, and especially Africa, food supplies are depleting. And, mm-hmm. the, and some you've heard through sources and just in general that they're running out, they have to go to the universal, the United seeds program um, 
and it's becoming a bigger issue every year. Yeah, so we have been contacted well from every continent, I would say. So we have been very happy to see so much interest in what we are doing. And uh, so basically it gives us hope in that what we are doing is kind of so that we are on the right track so that this is something that is needed. And certainly, I mean, going to Africa, in India, so that there are kind of more and more drought. So farming the traditional way is becoming more difficult. So, of course, there, instead of importing food, uh, kind of building this kind of food production facility would be maybe more feasible approach. And, of course, there's plenty of sun and renewable electricity there. So this uh, kind of good combination. And, and we and we look at that as using air and electricity as your main main resources. And what – so we, we talk about mixing it with water, the, the, the nitrate. Now, is that just – like regular water or can we mix it with salt water or a variety of different things? Because as you know, some, some areas don't have the water or the resources th- through that area, like Africa, some of the places just <laughs> desert. So actually if we take this direct air capture system so that we capture CO2 from air, we also get some water and this water okay. is, is enough. So, I would say that every place in the world there is more water in the air than there is CO2. So basically we get enough water. Certainly in the process we need water, but in the product there's not a lot of water that is going into the product. So that if we keep the process very optimal in terms of water use, so we can be very very frugal in water use. And that's great to know that. And I think people should understand that, that from what you're telling us, that can that plant can go anywhere in the world and it will find the resources. If you plotted it down in the middle of, of nowhere, it will find the resources right there and then. Is that about the correct, uh, in hypothetically? Yeah, I mean, that's the main thing. So we, of course, need to have uh, so, some minerals. So, of course, phosphorus, sulfur, calcium, potassium, sodium. So these we need to give the cells. So these we do not get from the air. And of course, nitrogen thing is another important thing. So of course, currently, ammonia is made from atmospheric nitrogen, but that's made using uh, natural gas. So that's with fossil resources. But it is, of course, Technically, it's just as feasible to make it from hydrogen made from renewable electricity and water instead of taking natural gas. So basically, (laughs) to cut it short, so ammonia as the nitrogen source can also be made from the air for our process. So 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 basically, all the main chemical elements, so carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, so these we get from air. So these four chemical elements. And you and me, we are 95% of these chemical elements. And the remaining 5%, so like iron, calcium, magnesium, zinc, phosphorus, sulfur. So these we need to import for the process. I'd say 95, 5% of me is fat. So I'd be, I got plenty of energy. So that's carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, <laughs> mainly carbon. Yeah, I got plenty of that, so I, I should be fine. Just tell me where to blow. <laughs> uh, me too. And and, and that and actually, I, I think what people may not know is you're actually the first company in the world capable of producing food by using this air capture CO2 in complete, continuous, uh, and just rich food. Is that mm. right? Yeah, so we have our, in our pilot, we have the air capture direct air capture system so we capture CO2 from air in our pilot so when how long have so you've been doing this for quite a while 
has the pandemic kind of put a, a, pro, a sl- slowing the process or have you guys been able to continue moving forward uh, during the pandemic? I'm not sure how bad Finland got hit with the pandemic. I know right now Italy, Germany, most of Europe and United States have been hit hard in the last six months. Has this put a, a um, to make it go forward or are we still on pace? Uh, I would say that it has it hasn't had a much of an effect on us. So Finland has not been hit so severely. So I guess we have, I mean, in Finland we have closed quite many things. So we don't have very many cases of COVID or very many deaths. So in our company, so we are currently we are 11 people. So we, it's not just very closed bubble, but it's kind of a, kind of our own bubble. In the beginning, we were kind of, kind of a team, teamed up so that people who didn't need to come to the lab were working from home. But, but currently everybody is at, at the office. And that's, that's good to hear. I know some, some businesses that have a very small have been in kind of like pods, these four people. So it doesn't affect the whole group. Yeah. So that was the thinking in the beginning, but currently we are all together. Well, and, and the nice part is that not many people know is you guys have received many awards. You were just in the top 10 startups in Finland uh, and you're doing really great work. And, and we appreciate that of what you're doing for the world in the future. Cause I think in the next decade, things are going to change differently to not the good from mm-hmm. what, if, if we keep on the pace that we're getting, well, let me ask you this. So we're at our stage right now. We're September of 2020 COVID still going. You're working with the space agency. What's next for solar foods? What, where do we look in the next 12 to 16 months. What's that look like? Well, very busy. <laughs> so, I would assume. So, of course, we need to start or kind of continue planning and start building the demonstrator facility. And then, then of course, the novel food permitting. We, we have to kind of proceed with this. <sighs> so... More busy than ever. Yeah, I, I, I would I would agree with you, and I think that that's one good thing is you're doing something good, mm-hmm. and you and you have a passion for it, which is really good, and I commend you for that. Yes, yeah, so I I mean I'm very motivated for this because I mean now finally, basically after twenty years of looking, we have finally found something that which we can actually do instead of just trying to figure out next project, next research project. And so this is actually concretely something where we can make an impact when which could become a reality. And it's good to hear, and you're doing a lot of great stuff with, with the space agency, what you're doing in the future and how we're going to change food production uh, moving forward. Hopefully um, one day in, a, in another year or so, we can come back on, hear about, what you, what progress we're at and see where we are. Um, I appreciate you coming on. Are you up for a little Q and a, we have some people that have asked some questions. Yeah. I'm happy to. Uh, the first question is from Chris. What is your most memorable career moment? Uh, most memorable. Well, I, I would say establishing solar food. So getting the first uh, grants and the first investor money, in the beginning of 2018 so when we really got started and really got the money and green light to go with this go with this plan well and i i think it also feels good that you know people are behind you and they're favoring you and i think that's you like people want you to succeed and we're going to help you do that Mm -hmm. yeah so that is very very motivating so that yeah, like I said, that uh, I really feel that we are going in the right direction now. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. Um, here's another question. 
Um, it looks like it's from Nicole. We made a van. Would you be able to eat the protein right from the bag or container? I would, it says contain, but I'm going to say it's container. Yeah. Um, I mean, would you eat wheat flour straight from the bag? In a way, it's possible. Yeah. Or then also we are kind of working to kind of texturize it. So make it this kind of, um, would say rice krispies type of thing or granola type of thing. So maybe um, not straight from the back, just as a flower, so that it's it's maybe a bit too dry. Well, and I, and I think as as the time goes on, it'll be progressed and and worked in a very many different ways. Yeah. So, like, I mean, how many in how many products we have wheat flour or corn flour currently so it, it's it, the analog analogy is the same so that it could be used in different food products normal food products as the protein rich ingredient well i that and that's good to hear like we're working on something very good that that can be mixed or done in the future that mm. with with the shortage of food in certain areas but at the same time there may be an opportunity that this product would help in a variety of different ways, maybe homeless feeding the homeless in some capacity because then they're getting their nutrients, no matter if it's something that you put on food that they're getting extra stuff or there, you can only imagine what you can do with this. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, those are just, I think, am I thinking in the right pick, right? Yeah. 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 Basically it's just an ingredient like any other. So, Mm -hmm. It's just produced in a different way. Produced, Correct. produced in a uh, so produced without any requirement for arable land. So without without agriculture, it, it makes it a lot easier to do. Correct, I, I would agree. Yeah, so it's kind of more more concise, more minimalistic way of making this ingredient. But then using this ingredient should not be any different from using any other other existing already existing ingredients. Exactly, and then there's less resources that you have to take from the ground or the world to produce this type of stuff. Yes. Yes. So, um, and then I had a couple. One other question. Uh, this one says, and I think we answered this, but you can ask the. What is the time frame that we are looking for this protein to be in a commercialized form? So 2023, roughly mid 2023, we should have the demonstrator ready and also the novel food permits granted, accepted. And uh, now we are talking mainly in, in Finland. And then probably by world, you're probably looking at three to five years. Would mm-hmm. that be? Would that be the? Yeah, the like that, yeah. And and we look forward to seeing that and and working with uh, the variety of organizations to really make a difference and an impact in the world. So, mm-hmm. but uh, Doctor, I appreciate you taking the time. It's always a pleasure. I know you're a very busy man right now. You're always welcome on on my podcast, and so we hope to. Uh, have you back in the future for any updates or outcomes. Uh, Thank you everyone for joining us today. You can check out other podcasts and interviews at anthonyvspano.com. Be safe and God bless.